Yeah, so I'm, I'm not uh, really connected to tall buildings at all. Um, I'm an interior designer and a product designer. And we've heard a lot about um, these uh, vertical villages and um, tall buildings. I wanted to talk a bit more about what goes on inside them, really. So, obviously, with Google, everybody's using quite a lot of uh, references that, that have been talked about a, a, a bit about the history of Sydney and, and, and the rest of it. I do think Sydney is unique in its landscape and its mix of nature and industry and uh, the amount of pleasure you can get out of just that we saw yesterday at the, at the opening party. But um, what was quite interesting about hearing all the other speakers talk, particularly the people from abroad, the people that are building buildings in Sydney, is how universal tall buildings become and, and how difficult it is to tell which city you're in. So I wanted to talk about that as well. Um, Obviously, it's in complete evolution at the moment. But there's a danger that it might start looking like any other city if we're not careful. Um, but I have, I have worked a bit on, on tall buildings, specifically Centre Point in London, which had a great um, brief for a, a bar and a members club at the top. And so we did what I thought was a very nice job on, on this uh, space, a, a very iconic bit of brutalist architecture. Again, uh, at the time, the biggest, the tallest building in, in, in London in the 60s, built by um, Richard Seifert, and very much hated as a building for a long time, but it's coming back into fashion. It's a very, uh, I think, attractive bit of um, structural engineering, apart from anything else. Um, but the, 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 the bar and club at the top was, was a, a great thing. Um, it, it failed really more on, on the um, experience of getting up to the top. So because there was a, a priority for the offices that were in between um, for the lifts, uh, you had an eight or nine minute wait at the bottom to get to the club at the top. And it made me think a lot also about um, how one needs to, to really think not just about uh, how amazing the views might be or how amazing the, the comfort might be, but really an integration of all of the services and the activities inside the, inside the building is essential. And, um, and this is something that we talked a lot about and we, we, we were just touched on with, with the double lift cars, for instance. Um, getting to the top and getting there um, without the, the long wait in a drafty atrium uh, was an essential part of, of this job, which wasn't thought through. Um, so that closed up for a couple of years. Um, so my other connection with, with uh, tall buildings is, is where I live. So this is my house. So I thought I'd introduce you to my house. I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a tall building fan. It's not, not a big tall building, but this is a tall building. Um, and you can see here, I've also ignored the connection um, with the ground completely, um, obsessing with, with the views from the top and, and, and the verticality of it and the way that I can, I can chop the, the, the floor plate into three different functions. I've got um, eating, living, and sleeping in, in, in these three floors, and then a roof deck as well. Um, but the difficult part, the part which, which um, I want to talk about really is, is, is this connection with the ground, which has been mentioned several times in, in the conference to date, um, but remains the, the, the most difficult thing to do, I think, when, when you're trying to connect a, a very tall tower to, to the ground plate. Um, so I, I'm not on my own, obviously, particularly in, in this context of, of fantasizing about tall buildings. And, you know, in, in popular literature and in fairy tales, it's something which people really do think a lot about the top. Um, and of course, you know, vertical buildings are going to become more and more uh, important, not for what they used to be, which were, you know, demonstrations of power or, 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 or ways of expressing religion or for military supremacy. Um, but really as a way to save uh, mankind from the urbanization. So get this right and everything will go fine, I think. And it's kind of interesting to see um, tall buildings, particularly in, in, in futuristic um, uh, contexts. I, I quite like science fiction um, in terms of its ability to express what um, tall buildings could look like. And there's this obsession with um, the top of the building and how uh, utopian those, those um, vertical structures become. Um, all science fiction really concentrates on, on what's going on at the top, which looks amazing and, and, uh, and very uh, appealing, if you like. And then down below, you get this dystopian um, effect where crime 
um, exists and darkness and all kinds of bad things happen at the bottom. And, but I think that that becomes the interesting part, that ecosystem at the, at the bottom. And in, in the context of the um, tower that we're working on, um, I do think that we're, we've got a chance of, of getting that connection between the tool building and the ground plate much, much better than um, it is at the moment. Um, uh, you can see how dense the, the streets become, these canyons that are created by um, all the tall buildings that are going up at the moment. And they block out the light. Um, they, they give you um, very concentrated traffic. Um, and uh, the, the regeneration of, of this area and, and the ambitions of the city council um, are, are starting to become quite interesting, the way they inter interconnect. Um, and, and also the way that people are changing the way that they, they use the city centre is becoming very interesting as well. It's much more than a workplace now. It really is a destination already for, for nightlife um, and for extending that working, working day. Um, so I did want to talk a bit about the evolution of the office particularly and, and the way that, that um, um, the way we work is, is completely transforming. Um, particularly in, in the design of the interiors, for, for me, my area of interest um, was sparked by doing a job in, in America where they still worked very much in cubicles in, um, in a company called McCann Erickson. I did a, a, a job redesigning their headquarters on, on Fifth Avenue, or Third Avenue rather, in, in New York City. And it was this thing that, that most people worked away from the daylight in tiny little cubicles. And as you progressed through the organization and became more senior, you, you gradually moved towards the window. And if you were really clever and very fortunate and spent a long time in the company, you might get a corner window with, with, with two, um, two windows looking out onto New York. Um, so the, the joy of that job was actually breaking down completely all of the um, all of the cubicles and, and giving everybody um, access to daylight and a view of New York and really liberating the, the space to, to really enjoy the city. And the, the, the big um, benefit of that job was really that, that not just um, the fact that people uh, no longer hid away in, inside their cubicles, but they started communing with each other at work and became more efficient at that. But even better still, um, they would stay longer um, in the working day and even bring their families to enjoy the view at the weekend as well. So instead of, of uh, work being very separate from life, um, by reducing um, the amount of compartmentalization and allowing people to see each other and see the city, um, they stayed longer at work. And I think, you know, the, 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 the thinking even maybe 10 years ago was, was that people really wouldn't come to work anymore. And they'd all be working in their garden sheds on their own, um, blissfully away from commuting to work. Um, and that was really the, the, the vision that we were sold by experts in the field, that people really weren't going to go and work in, 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 in offices or, or tower blocks at all anymore. But of course, this was completely misplaced fantasy. And people don't really want to work on their own at home, even if they, they can. Um, what they really want to do is, is commune together and cooperate, debate, and interact. Um, I think uh, people are going to be more and more attracted by the, um, by the options in a workplace and make that the choice of, of, of why they take a job in a specific firm or not. And so that's really what we're trying to work on um, in this tower. Um, I think that the idea that, that um, workplaces become a place of recreation, um, I first started noticing, um, particularly with the tech companies on, on the west coast of, of, of America, in San, around San Francisco, Google being the exemplar in, in, that, um, uh, in that case, where um, this idea that a modern company and a modern office didn't need to look at all like an office, but could look much more like a playground or an adventure park. And people would come, and they'd come in on skateboards, and they'd come and uh, play table tennis, and they'd, they'd play um, rather than work. And I think that's become almost a, a cliche with the, the bean bags and the, the hanging chairs and the bright colors, the, the primary colors, the, the astroturf and, and the rest of it. And it's something which I think has probably gone a bit far 
into informality and into play rather than a place where you feel you can work. So um, our, our first experience is actually in, in designing offices or, or where we overlapped with offices, but weren't offices at all. It was, like I said, the, the members clubs that we designed. So in, in the UK, there's this um, nostalgic uh, memory of, of the members club, a formal place where people would come um, and uh, particularly gentlemen with country estates would come to town and be able to do some business and relax with their friends, have lunch in town and possibly have a room there as well. And that's come back quite recently um, with a series of members clubs like Groucho's or so Soho House um, that were members clubs really for the media uh, types that, that where their business was more meeting people and having lunch. And um, these were really palaces of enjoyment. And, and we designed one called Shoreditch House, which is part of the Soho House group, which now has maybe um, 40 venues around the world. It's an international members club. And um, it's where I first started noticing how seamless pleasure and work can become uh, by giving people the facilities of a members club um, in their workplace. Um, they'll stay until late at night. Um, and enjoy a place and, and use it for entertaining as well as, as use it for, for more formal work um, by creating spaces that can be um, semi-enclosed or, or sectioned off. They can also have meetings. And um, even by designing furniture um, in a specific way, you can encourage them to, to have places where they can have more private conversations. The wingback chair in this, in this picture here we designed um, really with the idea of a nostalgic um, British typology reworked for the contemporary day. But what's interesting about the Soho House Group is that mobile phone usage is completely banned inside the club. So what people actually use these chairs for was to hide away uh, their mobile phone use um, from, <laughs> from their colleagues or the, or the people um, working in the club so that they could actually have uh, covert conversations. Um, so th there's, a, there's an interesting transition now, and it came obviously with, with wireless networking, and I, I notice there's quite a lot of people working here um, as I speak. You know, there's people on their phones, and it's, it's very hard to tell whether they're actually doing their Instagrams or whether they're doing um, work or whether they're actually just recording me and, and concentrating on the lecture. Um, <laughs> But, but the boundaries have completely collapsed, is what I'm trying to get at. And the more you can give people a high-quality environment with good quality coffee, with places that they can snooze, or places that they can um, have small meetings, then the longer the workday will become, and the more enjoyable work will become for those people. So um, the, the, uh, what, what we're calling these spaces in this building is actually um, third spaces. So third spaces become the, the places which are not public, nor are they um, rented by one of the tenants, but they're places that um, people can become members of and use in a much more flexible way or become an extra resource for the, for the more formal spaces which are rented to the tenants um, higher up in, in the building. So, you know, the, the message... I'm just getting my water here. The message is really um, the less it feels like an, an office... Um, the more it becomes a, 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 a village with all of the services and, and, the, and the, the quality of services and finishes that you'd expect from a boutique hotel, um, the more successful an office building will become. And we've heard a lot about villages, and, um, and it's become a bit of a buzzword in, in, the, in the Tall Buildings Conference that, that everything should become a village. But it's, it's quite hard to, to recreate the, um, the, the, the way that a, a village grows and evolves and, and, and isn't something which is city-planned and, and, and presented in one um, finished part. We're quite lucky with, with um, this tower to be reusing an old part of the tower and grafting on a new, new part, because that really is the way that villages um, do evolve. Um, the fact that we've also got even a village green, for instance, in the, in the, um, in the outdoor spaces, I think is quite unique in, in some of the um, towers that we've seen earlier on. 
And the way that connects on several different levels is very village-like as well. So in terms of, of the possibilities to make the thing uh, more organic, more interesting, more rich as a, as, a, as a proper village, I think those are boundless. And you can see with, with even the, the renders that, that you saw a bit earlier, the, the, the idea that you can have more open spaces, more uh, interconnection between the spaces um, due to this um, series of uh, not symmetrical um, and constantly changing floor plates makes it very village-like from the beginning. Um, with, with the 8,000 square meters of retail across the whole estate, I think also the idea that, that people can use the different levels for much more than just working or, or relaxing and the way that you interconnect them um, becomes very important. The current deck, which is actually already there, which I quite, quite like, um, is actually uh, a wind trap and a place where very few people go apart from the, the hardcore smokers. It's not a very pleasant place to be, partly because it doesn't really connect to any of the other spaces, um, the lobby or, or, or the shopping center below. And that's really gonna be dealt with with the new design. So the, the services and, and, the, and the quality of the services um, need to approach what people really do expect to see in, in, in boutique hotels. People have become much more sophisticated now in, in their choice of workspace. And you can see here from this, this image the, the way that we're going to try and make a, a connection between the outdoor and, and the indoor um, with uh, food and beverage as well. So this is a, a view of, of one of the bars that crosses uh, seamlessly between the outdoor and the inside space on, on that deck level that we're talking about. Um, the idea that, that instead of isolating a, 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 a park or a, a, a roof deck from the, the building, but really making it seamless is, is really important, but also activating it with a series of different classes and well-being. And you can see here a bit more the, the kind of richness of, of the space and these cutouts that Fred was talking about earlier, which allow people to um, come in from the street and invite people um, from the street into the building, into the retail areas. I think I was talking a bit about the, the context of, of Australia. I think it's, it would be a shame if it didn't feel like um, a, a place that was unique. I mean, you see this a lot in, in hotels and you see it a lot in office buildings that you could honestly be anywhere in the world. Um, but with the richness and, and, the, and the extraordinary nature, particularly of, of the plant life in Australia, gave us a lot of inspirations for, um, for this. And of course, with the different levels that we've got that, that have outdoor areas, we're probably going to be able to, to bring some of Australia's nature into the building itself. It's quite interesting that bot botanical gardens themselves don't actually have very many Australian plants at all. Um, they're all imported species. The, um, the colours we've taken very much from the, the amazing fauna of uh, Australia as well. And we started using some influences also from some of the more primitive architecture of, of Australia as well. So you see here what was um, previously a very, a very square and a very solid um, block, which is really the lift shafts that, that we were referring to earlier and you saw on plan as quite a massive block in, in this thing. And I was kind of intrigued by not only the, the, the way that um, Sydney has all of the little lanes that you, you come through and, and the tall buildings that block out the light and the way you go from very narrow lanes to, to expansive views of the city. And I think in, in this um, lift, lift uh, block and, and the central core of the building, we've tried to create some of that feeling of, of being constrained and then going out in the big spaces that have been created by 3XN, the very luminous spaces where uh, as you come out of the lift, you can really see where you are in the whole building. And I was really influenced by some of the, um, some of the more, like I was saying, primitive architecture, particularly of, of the miners that, that burrow into, um, into the desert in central Australia and, and create these extraordinary um, spaces for living um, to hide away from the intense sun and heat. Um, so you can see also the, 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 those rich colors that um, come from the, um, the mineral 
um, nature of Australia as well. Very warm stones that are um, very much part of the Sydney landscape. And we wanted to bring those also from um, the outside in. Usually it's used for um, the structure of the older buildings or cladding on the modern buildings. But the idea that the, the sandstone itself would, would come in and be part of the, of the core of the building rather than normal uh, hard granite imported marble that you see on, on most um, uh, office lobbies. Um, that would be also uh, really enhanced by the, the furnishings and, and really giving some proper softness to um, the interior where um, all too often you see in, in office lobbies um, very cold and uninviting furnishings. So we've been blessed with um, being able to, to have um, spaces which are flooded with natural light and allowing people to feel a bit more welcomed and inspired than they are at the moment. At the moment, they're, they're, they're funneled through a very narrow series of spaces um, into a shopping centre. And I think we'll see with the new design uh, a much more open, more luminous and more uh, natural um, interior to the, to the building altogether. Um, and that was partly kind of inspired by meeting Fred in the offices in, the, in, in Copenhagen of 3XN. And the way that 3XN um, really think of buildings as a series of layers um, which, which are interconnected in, in, um, in fresh ways. And, and here you see the model making workshop with an endless amount of, of models which, which kind of hack up the building into, into different levels and then reconstitute them. And, and we saw there very much uh, a, a kind of analogy with the way that the building could be designed and, and also with, with Australian nature as well. I was really inspired by not only the natural formations and, and, the, um, and the markings on some of the stone that you find in Australia, but also the, the deep cast mines that you see with these very similar um, contours to um, what's going on in the atrium um, that's been created by 3XN. And as an interior designer, just enhancing that from a, a materiality perspective, trying to get away from um, too much uh, uh, man-made materials, trying to soften up the curves even more and bring the natural inside was something that was very important to us. Um, and allowing people to start working in very different ways and trying to get away from the very square nature of, of furnishing in public spaces to make more organic, um, softer, softer, um, configurations of where people can commune in a much less rigid way. Um, so I think you'll see, you know, a next step, which is the one we're embarking on now, which is also commissioning some um, locally made product for the for the lobbies, and uh, and also making some site specific objects, which will be recognised as really part of the of the assets of the, of the building itself. So here you see the view of, of these, these very rounded and, and um, generous spaces that are being created, um, which I think will make it very different from uh, most workspaces that you are familiar with in um, Sydney. In fact, in the world. So I think just to say that um, it's an exciting time for tall buildings. It's, it's going to be the way that cities um, can absorb um, all that's thrown at them. Um, and the most important thing, really, is to consider not just the, the building itself, but the, the, the way it's used internally and the connections between the different um, trades that use it and the different ways that people um, are starting to work and live in the city itself. Mm -hmm.